So, TJ, are you ready? Okay. Thank you. Hello. 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 It's good to be back once again. Um, but this time I'm back under different circumstances. I am a broken, messed up person, and God has been revealing that to me over the course of the last couple months, and um, I've been really in a, a dry season in my walk with the Lord for probably six months to a year now, and just in a place where every time I read the Word, if I read the Word, I'm getting nothing out of it. My prayers are more focused on my needs than what um, God wants me to be praying for. Um, just really distracted in in everything when I do sit down to have quiet time. And, and so it's just really been a, a season of trial for me. And um, God has been slowly revealing more and more of the junk that's been inside of me. And of course that makes me feel so nice and <laughs> loved. Um, but it, it truly does make me feel loved by Him. But by him revealing what is in me, it is gross and it's nasty and um, it's been really weighing down on me and in June it just kind of all came crashing down. I had gone on an outreach with our discipleship training school and when I flew back into St. Croix, usually when I fly back there I can feel this spiritual tension on the island. and. This time was no different. I did feel it, but I felt it all around me, but also all inside of me. And I was just all over the place. And we had some time off after our school, and I was trying to process through what was going on and trying to get back with the Lord and just be like, okay, God, let's work on this. You know, I want to, I want to do this. And everything was just kept piling up and kept piling up and so I went to my base director and I said I don't know what's going on but I have no vision for the ministry that we're doing here I have no passion for the ministry we're doing here I feel like I'm burnt out and I don't even have anything inside of me to offer anybody let alone cry out to God for help and so I met with him and I was being with my pastor down there and we were trying to work things out and it still wasn't doing anything and so a couple weeks went by and I went to him and I said I gotta get out of here. I said I need to take some time and just kind of go into seclusion, um, take some time away from people, from ministry, from everything and just get myself in line with the Lord. I said I've lost I've lost my vision of the Lord. I don't know who He is to me. I don't know who I am in Him. Um, like I said, I don't have any vision or passion or desire for anything. And so I basically need to reset myself in the Lord. And so I did that and I came up here and I was blessed by Scott and Kathy to spend some time at their cabin at Echo Lake. I went camping at Whitefish Lake for a couple of days and then I spent some time in Glacier and it was just an awesome time. The first week, I was gone for about 10 days and the first week was terrible because I had to hang out with me and through God's revealing of who I was, I didn't want to hang out with that person and I didn't want to even really deal with the issues that were coming up and so the first week was tough and it was um, difficult. I did have fun times with the Lord of just you know going out on the lake and viewing the beauty or the scenery or going on runs around it. But I was just really trying to decompress that first week, and and so you know I was reading some books and just trying to take my mind to that place of solitude and calmness, and and it was good. And then. The Lord took me to Glacier, and as soon as I got there, it was just so incredible. And all of the songs we sang today were perfect for 
this season that I'm in, like those those times of if you take it all away, I'll still love you and your grace and love and all of those words, like they just penetrated deep into me. But when God took me to Glacier, I realized at that moment I'm seeing all of His glory in the mountains and the lakes and everything, and I was just so blown away. And that morning I said, Lord, I want to get back to the place of loving you when I first fell in love with you. I want that feeling, I want that joy, and I want that passion, that desire that just overflows for you, that makes me want to run after you and, and not chase the things of this world that are going to leave me dry and that I have been slowly running to in this season, taking my eyes off of you. And so I said, I just want this time, these next four days, to be dedicated to you, to just have you reveal who you are to me and who I am to you. And so we went on some hikes that day. I met up with a couple friends, which turned out to be the leading of the Lord. I was in this time, and so I was like wrestling, like, okay, I haven't seen this friend in like four years. I'm finally up in the area where she lives. Her brother's there. Lord, can I hike with them or do you just want it to be you and me? And he's like, no, let's hike with them. And so we go hiking and we were together for a couple hours and then I went on my way and they went home. And then I went to a lake and just started walking around the lake. And again, I'm just so overcome by God's glory and His power and his majesty and I just stop and I look and I'm like you created this Lord and you created it for me and when you are sitting on your throne creating these giant peaks you're like on this day I'm going to lead TJ here and he's going to see this and he's going to be reminded of who I am and who he is to me and so I'm just sitting there and I just start bawling my eyes out. I'm just like so thankful and so just falling in love with him all over again, you know. And, and it just blew me away of God's sovereignty. The fact that it says all throughout the word that before he created anything, he had me in his mind. And so he just slowly kept revealing these little bits of scripture to me and these little promises to me throughout that time. And... And so then, you know, we hang out and the flies start coming. And so I'm like, all right, it's time to leave this place. It isn't happy anymore. So I start walking back down to the lake. And um, I'm just like looking at the flat, calm lake. And I'm like, man, that's awesome. So I just sit down in an area. And I'm just looking at it and still just kind of praying and enjoying the Lord. And I just feel him say, do you want to skip rocks? I'm like, sure, I haven't skipped rocks in a long time. And so I look down at my feet, and there's a beach, probably the length of these chairs, all flat stones. There isn't a single stone that isn't flat. And I'm just like, where do I even start? I'm like, thanks, Lord. So I just pick up a handful and start chucking them. And like, I just felt for about 30 minutes to 45 minutes, I'm there skipping rocks feeling just like a little boy again, and just enjoying the Lord, laughing with Him, skipping and counting and seeing it twist and turn, and then I started skipping it, trying to get it over a log, and so that could, took a little bit more um, technique and stuff, and it was just fun, and so, you know, I'm just, again, just reminded of His love for me, and so later that night, I cook dinner and then go down to the lake to journal about the day and I'm just sitting there again looking at the lake and journaling and everything and all of a sudden like, I just go like that really quick and I'm just like, what the heck was that? Like, it was just like a jolt in my side and I'm like, did you just poke me? Because there's nobody around me and like it literally just felt like I was sitting at a table with a friend and you say something funny to him and poke him in the side. And that was the reaction that I had. And I just started laughing. I was like, Lord, you are so awesome. You are so fun. You're so cool. You're so majestic and all of these things. And it just, just brought me to 
laughter. And so I finish up journaling and I go to lay down. I'm just thinking of my day. I'm just like, wow. This morning I woke up and I said, Lord, I want to experience you on a personal level. I want to receive my joy in you. And I want to know who I am to you and, and rekindle that love. And like I literally just felt like I had just met this new person and we were best friends and we were just having like the time of our life. And I just started laughing again in my tent. I'm just like, today was an incredibly awesome day. And, and the days that followed that were the same. It turned out to be completely different than anything that I had expected. You know, I was like, okay. I'm going to take this time and I'm going to be quiet and I'm going to be in solitude and seclusion and I'm going to read my Bible and get all of these words and knowledge and all of this stuff and um, it was completely different. I didn't read my Bible at all in those, those days but I felt so much closer to the Lord and I had a desire to get back into the Word after that time and I thought that I was going to be alone and the Lord kept bringing people into my path, and I was able to spend the entire evening with a couple from Connecticut, have dinner with them, talk with them. They are fellow believers, and so we were able to encourage each other, and it was just awesome. And then the next day, I was able to pick up some backpackers that were coming out of the country, and we ended up spending the entire day and the night together. We camped together, hiked together, and it was just awesome, and they weren't believers, and so it was cool to see how God kind of led me away to the time of seclusion. He refueled me, and then He brought me back to believers so that I could fellowship with them and regain some more encouragement, some more strength, and then the next day, He set it up to where I was able to minister to these people. You know, they were going from one end of Glacier all the way to the other. And it turned out that I was doing the same thing that day. And so I was going to take them just about 15 miles to a place where they could catch a, a bus. And then I was like, well, I'm going farther so I can take you farther. And it just like, little by little, the farther we went, I was just like, well, no, I'll take you farther. And we took the going to the Sun Road, had lunch together, and then ended up hiking and camping. And so it was just really cool. And... And even this morning, you know, coming in here and saying, Lord, I expect to hear from you today. I expect to be filled from you, and I, I want to hear from you again. Because, again, like, I had this high moment with the Lord, and then I come back to real life, so to speak, and get into the busyness, busyness of my days, and I began to notice my joy level go down, and my desire for Him to go down. And I'm looking at everything in my life, my ministry, my finances, where I am, and all of these things seem to be in a pile of rubble around me. Like I literally, before I left St. Croix, I told my director, I said, I feel like the entire thing that I have built my whole life upon to this day is just in a pile of rubble around me. I, I feel like I'm standing on the foundation of the Lord, but I really feel like He is in a new time of building me. And it freaks me out because there's nothing standing around me. You know, I had to, and I still am, really trying to figure out my identity in Him, trying to figure out the dreams and the desires and passions that He has placed in me, and getting back to that place of intimacy with Him. And still, like, there's no clarity as far as anything of what he wants me to do next or where he wants to lead me, but like like that song said, I'm just waiting on him and and I'm nowhere without him and and that's where he has me right now in just a season of of trying to rid myself of everything that's holding me back from him and just trying to rekindle that flame of love and that passion and that desire that He has so much for me and He's just waiting for me to come and take it from Him. And, and oftentimes I think upon my situation, my sins and all of that and I let that cloud Him 
from me and I, I refuse to come to him because I have these weights upon me. It's just like, no, I want you to I want you to come to me and I want you to give me those so that I can give you the life that I promised you, the freedom that I have for you. And so yeah, that's kind of where I am. Um, people keep asking me how long long I'm here for. I don't know. I still don't have a return ticket to St. Croix. Um, I'm just waiting on the Lord. I can't move from this place until He releases me to. I can't do anything until He gives me the passion and the desire and the direction to do it. And so, um, yeah, if you guys would just continue to lift me up in your prayers um, as I am here just trying to hear from the Lord and just trying to again, just fall more in love with Him and to make Him everything in my life. Uh, I would greatly appreciate that. And, and I will be here and, and doing a little bit of traveling as I'm here as well. So, um, yeah, you will be able to talk to me and pray with me and all of that good stuff. So, that's kind of an update of where I am. And hopefully soon I'll be able to give you an update of where I'm going or what I'm doing. So, thank you. I had TJ over uh, earlier this week and he was sharing with me much of what he shared here. And, I'm grateful. I think it was a divine appointment because it reminded me of the importance of our relationship with God. You know, we oftentimes get caught up in religion and doing the things of God, but forgetting about God. And, you know, God wants relationship with us. He desires relationship. He wants to be our friend. And all too often, you know, we, we formalize the relationship. We set conditions on how far we'll allow him in. And, and we put these things up. And uh, I love skipping rocks with God. I love God just poking him in the side. <laughs> um, you know, I, I love that, that imagery. Because God, he's, he's huge. He's infinite. I mean, he holds the universe together just because. And yet he wants to come out and hang with me. He wants to come and hang with you and be intimate with you and know what's going on and be a part of your life and poke you in the side. I, I, I just thank you, TJ, for sharing with me. It was really a blessing. Um, we are in Colossians. We're starting chapter 2. But if you would, go ahead and open your Bibles. But actually, go ahead and open them to 1, because I'm going to start reading uh, in chapter 1. And then we're going to carry on into chapter 2. Now, I'm doing this because there was no chapter break when Paul wrote this letter. Okay. Chapters and verses were put in for our benefit. So when I tell you I'm going to preach out of a certain book, you know where to find where I'm preaching so I'm going to back up. I'm going to uh, start in verse 24 of chapter 1. And then I'm going to go through about verse 5 in chapter 2. So Colossians 1, verse 24. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's affliction for the sake of his body, that is, his church, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God, that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known. The mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom, that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. For I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not seen me face to face, 
that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, to reach all the ridges of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. For though I am absent in body, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the firmness of your faith in Christ. I'm shooting for five verses today, with a little couple extras thrown in. The first thing I want to point out, going back to the introduction to Colossians, do you remember why Paul was writing the Colossians? What was he speaking out in opposition to? Let's go back to, what was that? The Gnostics, okay? The, the pre-Gnostic movement, um, if you remember, uh, we talked about this. Basically what happened is um, there was this group that was combining some teachings from the Far East, some teachings from Greek, and uh, they were trying to combine it with Christianity. And what they were saying is you have to have this secret knowledge in order to be saved, in order to know God. And Paul's going, wait, wait what are you talking about secret knowledge? He's made known to us everything that we need to know. And so... Uh, that's why I started back in chapter 1, because there's a couple of verses I want you to pay attention to. Um, verse 26, well actually I'm going to back up to 25. Um, he's, he's speaking about the church of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known. The mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. Okay? Listen. Christianity is only a mystery if you're not a Christian. Okay? If you are a brother, sister in Christ, God has revealed to you everything you need to know. There is no super secret knowledge. There's nothing that you have to go out there and, and reach certain levels you know, it's not like a video game where you advance so far and then you get a secret. And then you have to advance a little further to get another secret. It's not like that. God has revealed this fully, but only to the saints. See, that's one of the things that I watch for in people that profess to be Christianity, to, to be Christians. Okay? Does this make sense? Does this make sense? Now, I'm not saying all of it. There are things in here that are still mysteries. God has chosen to reveal certain things to us only in part, mostly because we're dumb. Okay? Because you've got an infinite intelligence trying to cram all that knowledge into little tiny IQ people. Okay? We only have so much head space. And I think he just he wants things to be um, a mystery because he wants us to trust him. Okay? Remember, it doesn't say in Hebrews, it doesn't say without knowledge it's impossible to please God. It doesn't say without wisdom it's impossible to please God. It says without faith it is impossible to please God. He wants us to trust Him. Okay? He wants us to trust Him. And God will put us in where we have to trust Him. So that, that, that muscle, that faith muscle can grow. Alright, so moving forward... Now, Paul is not just, just idly sticking this in here because further down, uh, jumping up to chapter 2, he's talking about... Um, I'm going to go to verse 2. That their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Now, listen to this warning. He says, I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. Okay? Um, does anybody have the NASB? New American Standard? Could you read that, that last line right there um, that says, um, no one may delude you with plausible arguments? Uh, verse 4. I say this so that no one will delude you. 
Plausible? Uh-huh. In the NASB? Uh -huh. Argument. Go ahead, New Jersey. I say this so that no one will believe you with persuasive arguments. Persuasive arguments. Somebody have the NIV? Yeah. Would you read it for me, please? Just verse 4. I tell you this so that no one may deceive you by fine sounding arguments. Fine sounding arguments. We're going to touch on this again next week when we, we move down a little bit further. Do you guys understand that the world has spent its time, its energy, the enemy has devoted a tremendous amount of energy to come up with fine-sounding arguments to delude you, to get you off track, to deceive you, to lie to you, to get you to believe things that are not true. Paul is telling us these things so that we will not be deluded. We will not be deceived. See, this is where truth is found. Right here. This is the yardstick by which we measure everything that we encounter in life. And if you don't know the measure, how can you accurately measure what you are being presented with? Okay? How can you do that? Um, you ever tried to build anything without a tape measure? Yes, I have. There's a little wonky. No, I was a lot wonky. Like, you know, and then I put a rock under. <laughs> this, is, this is the measure. We have to know this. We have to be involved in this. We have to know this intimately. Okay? Guys, it's not sufficient to get up in the morning and read your daily devotional and catch a couple two or three verses. It's not enough even to read a couple of chapters. Man, I can think about a lot of things when my eyes are roving over the page. How much for lunch? Boy, I hope it's that really good sandwich you made the other day. I hope it's not that nasty soup. I think I got rid of all those cans. And Jesus said, huh, I wonder if it's going to be too hot to mow today. Uh, I bet you it is. I probably shouldn't risk it. I should probably wait till I know it's cool. And all of a sudden I get done. All right, let's go. What's for lunch, babe? Jackie soup. <laughs> How about memorizing this? How about devoting time to committing God's Word to memory? Saturating yourself with it. Saturate, you know, I'm, I'm gonna, I, this is, this is going to be a confession, okay? Our family talks in quotes, in movie quotes. We can quote dozens of movies. Some of my children can quote the entire movie. In the right voices, with the right inflections. And I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not good at quotes. I get corrected all the time. Dad, yeah, that's not how we said it got the idea. Wouldn't it be great if we could do that with this? Wouldn't that be fantastic? So that when somebody comes to us with a fine sounding argument, we can withstand them with the truth? When the, I think it was a bank in New York, they, they sent a number of their tellers to um, well, it's not the FDIC, but it's the federal, the people that make our money. And they sent them there to take their counterfeit money course. So they could determine, they could look at something and go, okay, this is counterfeit. Now, what is interesting about this course is that during the entire time the people are there, they never touch any counterfeit money. All they touch is the real thing. Because the idea is that if you know the real thing, you will be much more able to spot a fake. Okay? I know people that devote tremendous amounts of time to learning about cults and occults and other faith systems. And they can argue a particular faith system, but they've yet to learn their own. They've let, yet to get this soaked into themselves. And so, 
I can spot a particular counterfeit if I study that counterfeit, but what happens if another one comes along? And there's a lot of resources being poured into fine sounding arguments. Listen to me. We have an entire college and university system that has done nothing but dedicate itself to come up with fine sounding arguments. Fine sounding, but they're lies. They're lies. They're lies, they're lies, they're lies. It's something the enemy wants to put in to get you off track. And I know so very many Christians that are so easily derailed with a logical argument. I know so many Christians that go, oh yeah, abortion's okay. They didn't even talk about that in the Bible. What Bible are you reading? Really? Oh, you know those things where it talks about homosexuality? That's not really what it's talking about. It's talking about abusive relationships. What? Oh, no, really, because see, God was only writing that for a specific time. Because your God is too stupid to be able to see for all time. He only wanted that for a particular time. Listen to me. If that's the case, then throw it away. Throw it away. Because if you are going to pick and choose what is His Word, you have replaced God. Okay? You have replaced Him. If He saw fit to include this in His Word to you, there's a reason for it. It's not an accident. It's on purpose. Okay? You've got to know this. Believe it or not, that's not really what I wanted to talk about. <laughs> in your bulletins, I'm gonna, I'm, I want to fix on one little phrase here. Paul says, for I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you and for those of you to see and for all who have not seen me face to face. Do you struggle for your brothers and sisters in Christ? Do we, do we really struggle for them? When somebody tells you, like when you hear uh, somebody like TJ shared with us that he's, he's been burdened and he's been struggling in his walk and, and it's just dry. Do you take that before the throne? Do you lay that at the feet of God, the one who can do something about that? So Paul goes on, he says something right after this. He says that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love to reach all the riches of full assurance. Now, knit together in love. What do you suppose that means? What do you think he's talking about when he says being knit together? Hmm? Bonded to what? In the bulletin, I, I placed a, an insert. This is ten scripture passages that talk about the body of Christ. We're in trouble. The church in America is in trouble. We've talked about this a number of times. See, I want you to ask yourself this question. I want you to ask yourself honestly this question. Do you really believe that Jesus Christ is your Lord? Is God your boss? Because if He's your boss, then you are obligated to do what He says to do. That's kind of the way it works. How many of us would work very long for an employer if we didn't do what he told us to do? We wouldn't be there very long. And yet, we have this mentality with God that we can pick and choose what we want to do. Now, let me clarify what I'm saying before I get too far into this. I don't believe that this is a salvation issue. Okay. 
I believe this is a holiness issue. I believe this is a strength in your life walk issue. What I'm about to share with you. All right? Let me put it simply. You need to get your lump in church. Okay? God has orchestrated it. I don't know why. God didn't see fit to run things by Glenn when he made things. He didn't call me up and, hey, what do you think about this? Which way should I do it? God doesn't require our understanding. Okay? Let's go back to that verse. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. We trust Him. Okay? Sometimes I don't understand why He says the things that He does. Why do we have to do this this way? I don't know. But He designed it. So He probably knows what works best. So in your, your thing, in the insert, I, I listed out a number of scriptures. And I want to share with you, I'm not going to read all the scriptures. I'm going to refer to parts of them. Please take it home. Read it. Be familiar with it. Be cautious of looking to make excuses to reject it. Acts. Chapter 10, verse 28. says, Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God which he obtained with his own blood. Now, this is Paul's farewell address to the churches in Asia Minor. He knows he's going off to be imprisoned. Possibly to die. And he's talking to the overseers, the bishops, the elders that are gathered together. And he tells them, be careful, pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock. Okay? Like he tells Timothy, watch your life and your doctrine closely. In which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God which he obtained with his own blood. Now, there's a couple things that are here. First, the flock needs overseers. How many here are sheep? Okay, because your only other choice is a goat. So if your hand's not up in the sheep, the sheep, you're a goat. How many are sheep? Okay, I see a couple of goats. If you are a sheep, you need an overseer. Do you understand that? If you are a sheep, you need to be in the flock. If you separate yourself out from the flock, you're easy prey for the wolf. You separate yourself out from those that would caretake the flock, you're easy prey for the wolf. Okay? Wolf is used to describe our enemy. It's also described as a lion. Well, how do they work? They cut out from the flock the one they want to eat. Alright? So, as an overseer, my job is to take care of you. Yeah, it's not just my job, it's your job too. We take care of each other. But you have to be a part of a flock. Now listen, we've got a bunch of families gone today. This has absolutely nothing to do with families being gone today. My hope is that they are in worship with a body of believers somewhere. When you have to miss church on Sunday, you're going out of town, that happens. Go somewhere else and worship. Go worship with other believers. You might even find a song there that you like and you can bring back and share with us. But don't waste the opportunity. Okay? Really, in light of eternity, what is more important? So, we have to belong to the flock. I'm going to move forward here. In Romans chapter 12, Paul writes, For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members one of another. Okay? Now, he's talking about two things here. We're gonna, you, you guys ever heard the, the term, the church universal? Have you ever heard that? Basically, that means all the believers everywhere. Okay? That's the body of Christ, all the believers everywhere. So, we have brothers in Christ in Madagascar. Okay? We have brothers in Christ in 
Japan, in Russia, in England, in South America. We've got brothers and sisters of Christ all over this place because we're all the body of Christ. But do you notice something that he says right here, right at the end of what I read? And individually, members of one another. I believe right there Paul is speaking of the church local. This group. Okay? Because if you were still speaking of the church universal, how could we be members with the... Uh, let's just do Christian Life Center up in Missoula. I mean, they're all the way up there. Let's, let's, let's go with uh, Lakeside Church down in, in Houston. No, let's not go with that church. Let's go with a different church. No, really. If he is still speaking of the church universal, how can we be members one of another? I think he's speaking of the church local. Okay? I think he's speaking in this context how it relates to us, Jesus Community Church, even though I'm on Okay? So, I've heard people say... Yes. I don't think everybody has one of those. Does, is anybody missing the insert? Everybody have the insert? You need the insert right here? Christy, would you grab them and bring them over here? Or Ben? Okay, so moving on. I'm only, I, there are 10 passages in this insert. I'm only going to touch on one more. Okay, we're, we're coming up on noon. Um, not that I'm particularly concerned about getting out at noon, but I, I don't like the heat. And I know you guys don't like the heat, and you're sitting a lot closer to each other than I am sitting to you. I would like you to flip open your Bible. Let's go to 1 Corinthians. We're going to go to chapter 12. Now listen, people, this is a serious matter here. I know quite a few Christians that don't attend church and don't feel the need to attend church. Oh, I, I read my Bible, I study the Word of God, I spend time in prayer, I'm good. Listen to what Paul has to say. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, all were made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God has arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts in one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor. And on our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty. Listen. If you have God's Spirit in you, you have been brought into the body of Christ, and you have no right to say, I don't need this body. Okay. That's not given to you to do. That's sin. Okay. That's error. That's a lie. That's a plausible argument. I've heard many logical, fine-sounding arguments as to why people don't need to be involved in a local body. I've heard some sad and decrepit ones. I've experienced them myself. Church is full of hypocrites. Yeah. We're all sinners. We're all trying to do the best we can with what we got. We're all growing. If you come to a perfect church, guess what? 
It's not perfect anymore because you're there. <laughs> right? I mean, the only perfect church I've ever found is one that's completely empty and air-conditioned. <laughs> and as soon as I walk in, it's no longer perfect, although it still does have air-conditioning. Okay? You don't have the right to separate yourself out from the body of Christ, regardless of how much of a jerk they can be. Because we're all jerks sometimes. Okay? We're all jerks in church sometimes. I think that is God left that on purpose so that he could demonstrate how marvelous his grace is. Okay? You know, I, I get distracted sometimes. I get a little distraught sometimes when I hear people talk about how great their pastor is. You need to come to our church because our pastor. Paul addressed that earlier in this book, 1 Corinthians. It's not Paul that died for you. It's not Apollos that died for you. It's not James McDonald that died for you. Okay? It was Jesus Christ and him alone. Don't get caught up in the good parts or the bad parts of the people around you. Get caught up in the absolute marvelous, fantastic, awesome person of God. The one that likes to poke you. To get you over yourself. The one that longs to be intimate with you, to be your friend. The one that can be with you in those dark hours. And is still with you even in the bright ones. Although all too often when things are bright, we don't really notice it, do we? Oh, I got this, God. This is good now. All right. You can take a back seat. Ah! And here he comes again. Okay? Listen. This body, I, I'm bragging. I think we've got the best body that I have ever been privileged to be a part of. Okay? I think this is the best body. I'm bragging. And you're sinners. <laughs> and I'm a sinner. We are all saved by his grace. And that's so marvelous. So beautiful. Okay? So... Take a look at that passage, the, the, the passages that I've given you. Be honest with yourself. Is this God's Word? Am I in obedience to God's Word? Am I willing to change my life to be in line with what He wants? Talk to Him. Pray with Him. Is this a salvation issue? If you skip church next week, are you going to hell? No. But when you make it easy to miss church, it's very easy to miss church. Okay? I woke up this morning and my toe hurt, so I stayed home. What? Come to church, we'll pray for your toe. We'll lay, well, I have Dennis lay hands on your toe. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, this is a place of security. They call this a sanctuary for a reason. Okay? They call this a sanctuary. This should be the safest place that you know of. We're going to blow it. We're going to make mistakes. Don't head for the hills. Get right back in. Help fix it. Help put it back to the way it should be. Right? Because it takes the body. Sometimes I need an ear to scratch, and I need a finger with which to scratch it. Right? That was lame, right? <laughs> Every one of you is needed in the body of Christ. There's no one of you that is, is, is superfluous. Every one of you is needed. Every one of you is needed right here in this local body of Christ. Every one of you. Okay? Okay. Are you convinced of this? Yes. Okay, you got to be careful of saying yes, because if you say yes, then you're the one that I'm going to come to when you don't show up. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not looking at you. Okay. <laughs> okay.